Welcome to Charts and Coffee. Happy Friday morning. Happy non-farm payroll Friday morning. We're taking a look at the uh, NASDAQ and the S&P. We just wrapped up a Sector Secrets Mastery session specific to the non-farm payroll, the jobs number, the big jobs number, hot zone, and a couple things to, to keep in mind when it comes to this hot zone. The Federal Reserve has a has a dual mandate, which means that uh, they're not only keeping an eye on that inflation trajectory, right? Their inflation target, but they actually have to also keep the, what they've, the self-imposed mandate also says that they can't destroy jobs <laughs> on the way to that inflation target. So this morning we talked about what we call a first come first serve hot zone trade, where we use our hourly price movement ranges to set up trades on this, on this event. Uh, ultimately, uh, this was a mildly bullish morning. Trade trades were uh, more likely to be an hourly price movement range buy going into the uh, the hot zone, and that's pretty much what we've got. But the ramifications are far far broader, and we'll talk about these uh, these things here as we go through today's show. But as always, if you have any questions, if you have symbols that you're looking at, feel free to type them in. Phone lines are open for your request. Shout out to the folks in the Simpler Essentials room. I'll be keeping an eye on all that. Again, shout out to uh, the folks at the Simpler Trading YouTube, uh, my YouTube at Raggy Horner, as well as my uh, folks over at Twitter X, whatever the heck that thing's called now. Uh, so great to see you all. Um, as always, anytime we have a hot zone, uh, there's going to be potentially a trade, but some hot zones are more important than others. And in this case, what we're talking about is the target rate probabilities. Now there's going to be a lot of headlines and I've saw, I've seen some ludicrous ones. Uh, the Lorna Bot and I were just laughing over this headline about, I don't know, Fed swaps. And you, when you Google, when you Google news non-farm, you know, there's a number of people whose job it is to write about the market, not necessarily to trade it like you and I do, to talk about what happened. We have a magic decoder ring, right? We have a magic decoder ring. And that is traders who are trading a contract called the Fed Fund Futures. These are traded on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And the Chicago Mercantile Exchange has done this amazing job of distilling that data and giving us what you see on the screen right now. And that is the target rate probabilities. What do the June contracts of Fed Fund Futures, what are they pricing in? What are the July contracts pricing in? And I'll tell you, it's, it's, not, as, it's not as dovish as I would have liked, but it's certainly not a no for July. Now, remember, we've been saying June is possible, right? And it's not that it's not possible. This is how we look at this. Where are my drawing tools? Okay. This is how we look at this without having to listen to the gobbledygook of opinion. This is data, right? Data doesn't have an opinion. It just is what it is. So if I take a look at where we are right now, 525 to 550, that maps to this column right there. That is the hold column. And 43.3% expectation for a hold. But there's 53.2% expectation for a quarter point cut. That's higher than 43. There's a 10%. And 10 is very small, uh, a chasm between the two. Uh, we want to see far more lopsided. Uh, we want to see this column far higher if this cut is, is likely. In fact, to me, how high is high? We want to see it at about 80%. So we could call it kind of quote unquote fully discounted. So June, as you can see, is not much better than a coin toss, although possible for the cut. July gets far more interesting. So once again, we take a look at what July contracts are saying. And again, if we're at 525 and a half, 525 and a quarter to 525 and a half, that smaller column is the hold column, 28.8%. 49% is for the quarter point cut. 21%, which is not that far from the hold column, is that we've cut in June and we're getting a cut in July. That's only 21%. But look, the hold is only 28, almost 29. So this is what we've got 
in terms of the uh, way in which the target rate probabilities are showing us what the data, not a headline, not a opinion piece, right? This is what the data says. So I'm not ruling out July. Now, obviously, as we get into September, things look far clearer, which is to say, look, gang, when we get the rate cuts, is far less important at this point to the equity markets than the fact that we're likely to get them, all right? And so that's really it. That's really the way in which we look at this data. Is September, again, let's do the same thing for September. If someone says, Rog, what is the most confident month of being lower in rates? Well, that is in fact September, because again, the current rate is five and a quarter to five and a half. That's this. There's only a 9% chance that we haven't already cut, right? Or if you want to look at it, there's only 9%, 9.2 that we hold, right? That's it. Everything moves on to there's already been a quarter point cut. There's already been two quarter point cuts. Or in this case, way over here, that by the time we get to September, there's three quarter point cuts. That's how you read this data. And by the way, when we were doing the the live trading, the live analysis, um, the live look at the non-farm payroll and the mastery this morning, one of the things we mentioned is the order in which I even look at any of this. So number one is I'm looking at the price chart. Number two is I'm looking at this, the CME FedWatch tool. And then number three, and we we didn't even get to this till well after 10 minutes past non-farm payroll, I'm actually looking at the NFP. That's the least important. The time is far more important. 8.30 a.m. is far more important than whatever this is because the, re the reaction is going to play out in price and then the response to that data is going to be here at the target rate probability. So if you're getting caught up in sometimes the data and thinking that's not really giving me the clarity, the clarity that I want, right? Um, then I'm just going to move on to the other places, whether it's a trade or whether it's just a macro assessment, those are the two main jobs. And none of it has to do with whether or not non-farm payroll really beat or not. The reaction is where it's at. Remember, we're reaction focused. We're not analysts. I mean, unless someone's going to be zooming in to television, we really don't have an opinion about, here we go, this. All right. So what ultimately did happen with non-farm? This is the last and least important. So here is the non-farm payroll. Again, what's most important is the time because that's really the factor in terms of the timing of the setup. And you'll see here everything, uh, wage inflation going up, that's actually good. That's actually fine. Check. Non-farm beat, oh gosh, yes. Right, we, we had a slight downward revision of 5,000 jobs from previous, but that's nothing compared to 270,000. Expectations were at 212. And then we came in at 303. Now, please know, not everyone is expecting 212. There is a range. This is the consensus. This is the forecast that is on Forex Factory. There might be a slightly different one on trading economics. There might be a slightly different one on any number of economic calendars out there. Each, each major big bank, right? All the big banks are going to have their own number. So there is a, there is a, there's a spectrum of what's expected. So that's something else to keep in mind. It's not a, it's not a, widely held, everyone agrees that consensus was 160 or 170 or whatever it was. Notice the forecast and the consensus here at trading economics were a little bit different, right? Than what we just talked about. Nonetheless, 232 is what we can all agree upon. And we can all agree upon the fact that based on consensus and forecast, but there there'll be some banks that will be very different than these. So keep in mind the, the expectations are not everyone's thinking the same thing. All right, so that's a look at non-farm. Now let's go take a look at the reaction on the on the indices. Uh, yesterday, I want to mention this because this is really important. We did we did a we did a discussion of this. My sector secrets mastery folks, we have a video dedicated to this. If you take a look at your alerts, you'll see uh, a video. I think I called it something like "This has only happened um, twice this year." Let's talk about what I was what I was noting. So <clears throat> bear with me here. I've already been talking a lot this morning. All right. 
No, I think I need coffee. All right, hang on. No, my body said, no, what is this water? Coffee time. Okay, got, got the uh, rock in the, the Snoopy mug. Love me some Snoopy. Mm, new favorite mug. All right. So when we look at what's happening, this is the S&P, by the way. We look at what's happening on the S&P. A lot of folks are asking, Rog, what happened yesterday? I'll tell you exactly what happened yesterday. Let's build this out from the tools that we have that are not getting swept up in, oh my gosh, that was a big candle, that are not getting swept up in, oh my gosh, what did FOMC say? This focus is price and participation. Price and participation. And, and this is how we can best channel our inner Vulcan, our inner unemotional, unbiased selves. Read the dashboard, study the tools, trust them. Now, the thing that's only happened twice this year happened obviously once yesterday, and it happened one other time. And what I'm talking about is when we have volatility that exceeds the 68% probability of historical range. That's measurable. There's no emotion there, right? The reason I can keep steady and, and arguably we could say maybe this is the third time, but we've only seen this two, maybe three times this year. So am I going to look at this candle? And it's not the size of the candle, gang. It's the price and participation and the volatility reaction. So we've had big candles. It's not the big candle. Please remember, don't get swayed. If you're not getting swayed by a big up candle, please don't get swayed by a big down candle. Right. I know the fear part, the lizard brain is a, is a tough thing to shut off. But at the end of the day, this has only happened three times, arguably twice, where we exceeded the 68 percent volatility. So this is not the new normal. Right. This is not the way we've been operating. Please don't let one candle change your mind. What else? Let's take a look at our structure and keep in mind that rather than talk about this as a trend, let's talk about this as energy right? Because when we are, let's say the analogy I like to use is if I'm heading down the highway at the speed limit, of course, and I just let off the gas, right? So I'm already booking down the highway 60 miles an hour and I simply let off on the gas. Does that turn the car around? Does that stop the car? No, we know we're still going to coast. So we have to keep that in mind. If the previous trend was up, and, and, this, and this adjustment on the structure tells me, yeah, the market's letting off the gas a little bit. There's a lot of confusion out there. Jerome says we're going to cut rates this year. Then we have random Fed members running around telling everybody no cuts. Now the no cut headline is out there. Gang, abandon the no cut headline. Please, please do. There's no data to support that. There's no data to support that. Now, if we take a look at this, this is the market coasting. That's, that's all that it is. If we're still looking at bullish energy, is this a reversal? Or is this simply us, you and me, we have to adjust our expectations around new highs? That's the adjustment, gang. The adjustment is now we're dealing with a market that's kind of stepping off, you know, letting off the gas a little bit. I'm going to lower my expectations for new highs, but I'm not going to stop being bullish. There's nothing, and this is, by the way, a daily chart. Now, if you're looking at a different time frame, you know, we have to be specific to the time frame. So this is now the market just letting off the gas on the daily time frame of the S&P. Let's take a look at the uh, NASDAQ. Let's do the same thing. All right, here we go. Now, the NASDAQ, gang, could, does anyone disagree that the NASDAQ has been overall moving higher? I, I don't think any, and this is, this is the 1st of January, right down here. This is this year. Has the long side been the best side? Again, come on, right? Of course. This is a perfect example of how when the gas pedal is pushed and then lets off, that's energy. That's just the gas pedal being left off. We're still coasting down the highway at a rather quick speed. Do you see how continuation, continuing in the direction is the most Likely, that's the probable side. And yet, every new high, every pullback is a reason for bears to come out and say, this is the end. 
at some point, after being frankly wrong for three months and arguably far longer than that, let's limit it to 2024 action. It's been wrong every time. So eventually, yes, there might be a high that pulls back or there might be one of these candles. All right. Now, gang, I'm talking my book. This is not this is not just, you know, I'm talking about what I'm doing in the mastery and not just yesterday. Am I going to reduce my entire season of trading or ball players? Am I going to reduce my entire season to one night game that I lost? Or am I going to look back on what we've been doing all year and saying, oh, yeah, this has been growing an account. It's made no sense to be expecting bigger drops. And by the way, this is not that big a drop. What makes it unique is the fact that that candle, that one candle on Thursday exceeded the historical price minimum range. So yes, it definitely got our attention, but has it done anything to the structure that would suggest it's now time to start shorting everything? Again, time frame does matter. And I'm talking about a daily time frame right here on the NAS. But the NAS hasn't been as clear an overall uptrend. Okay, let's go to the Dow. Dow has been not as steady as the S&P, maybe not as unsteady as the NAS, but for the most part, we've been looking higher. The Dow has my attention. The Dow absolutely does because for the first time this year, so I'm open to changing my mind, but the data and my indicators, my dashboard, right? Do we, do we, uh, anyone out there fly? I don't fly. Do you override your gauges? I'm a diver. Do I override my air gauge, my depth gauge, my time underwater gauge? Of course not. I don't override that. But when it changes, I've got to note it. There is a change. The Dow has now plotted two red candles. Is that a downtrend? No. However, this is now a little bit more bearish neutral. The trend that proceeded was up. The general direction is still up. What this tells us, though, is if the Dow is going to resume the overall uptrend, it's going to be a lot more heavy lifting and it's going to be a lot more volatile. And I absolutely start to cap my expectations on new highs to resistance that's already been put in place. All right. That's the way we look at this. Now, there are some sectors within the Dow that, you know, this is where if we start getting specific to sectors, we're going to find a lot more happiness. Not everything is going to be clear on the indices. I'm happy when I have clarity. What's clear? XLE. This is energy. It's a piece of the Dow. It's also a piece of the S&P. What's clear? Industrials, right? Do we have some of these unusual candles? Yeah, industrials had one of those exceeding the 68% probability. How many times have we done that? One? Uh, once. Now, you might say, Rog, what are you looking at to say that? This is the daily price movement range. Notice how the gold and the gray crossed. That's what I'm talking about. When they cross like this, that is exceeding the 68% probability. That is one candle, one candle this year on industrials that has done that. So please, gang, don't live and die by every one candle. Please don't be a perma bear. The overall direction has been up. Now, if you're watching this show, you're not someone who's saying, Rog, I'm looking for tops to play a mean reversion. And if you are, look, that's not the way this game is to be played. I'm going to be very clear about that. This is the direction. So I can try and play mean reversions, but why? Because let someone else do that. Let someone else say, this is the top and I'm going to get short. I'm happy. I'm actually rooting for those traders because I need those traders to step in and do that so I can do what? Play what is highly more profitable and probable, which is the darn continuation. Please, 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 if you are a mean reversion trader in an uptrend, you are top picking, and I'm not going to hedge that, right? So that is the way I would look at something like the Dow, the S&P, the NAS, industrials, energy, right? There are strength corners of this market. And notice I'm not really focused on tech. We haven't been doing much by way of tech uh, in quite a few weeks, because when you look at the structure of, say, XLK, when you look at the structure of SMH, right? Those aren't looking like XLC, are they? Not even a little bit. So please remember, we don't have to trade tech. We don't have to trade NVIDIA. We don't have to trade Apple. What we do want to do is ask ourselves, what are those sectors that might be doing the heavy lifting for the Dow and the S&P mostly? And that's energies and industrials. All right. So that's the aftermath of 
non-farm payroll. Hope that helps. Uh, I definitely don't want to say this is the only way, but the only thing that I can frankly, openly, transparently share is what we are actually doing. And that matters to me. And, and remember, if you are looking for shorts, they're out there. They're out there. But please remember, we are still in, for the most part, a rather dovish environment. We are getting ready for rate cuts. We still have uptrends. And that's still the dominant direction. Okay, gang, as always, thank you so much for being here for Charts and Coffee. I do appreciate the time. We've been doing this now for three years. And if it wasn't for you, I'd be talking to myself. So thank you so much. I'll see you on Sunday for the Top Tier Outlook at 6 p.m. And uh, that is a wrap. I'll see you on the Sector Secrets Mastery in just a moment. Be good to each other, gang. Have a great weekend.